Eric Holmes, welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, you've had a really interesting journey through the video game industry. I think the last time we talked to you was on the Arkham Origins cover story trip. That's right, when you guys came up to Montreal. Yeah, that was a while ago. Uh, how are you feeling about that whole Batman saga of your life in retrospect? Oh, uh, I'm a huge Batman fan. I, I, I love the Batman property, and I always have, so I'm eager to see what other people do with it. Yeah, what was the launch of Origins like for you? Because you guys were keeping a crazy secret the entire time. Uh, is it is it fair to spoil Origins at this point? <laughs> do I have your permission, <laughs> well, sir? People had three years, I suppose. So All right. If they didn't play it, they should have played it. So it turns out the Joker is a huge part of that game, but you guys were... Would you say lying or just bending the truth a little bit in terms of promoting that game, not talking about the Joker? Uh, well, I mean, the Joker, as a character, he is supposed to surprise you, right? He's supposed to uh, do the unexpected. He's expected to steal every scene. He's expected to be, uh, you know, it's kind of like the devil. He's, he does terrible things, but you love watching him doing those things, and you just uh, can't get enough of it. So he's like a bad habit in a way. Um uh, and I think that if I could have changed anything around then, I would have loved to have had less imagery of him out there before we launched because um, people love him, right? People love him. They love to see him. And um, uh, people, you know, we showed video of some of the scenes with him beforehand. And I think it would have been a wonderful magic trick to not have said anything about him before we launched. I think that would have been an interesting thing to, to see how people reacted to it. Yeah, yeah. I guess I'm just mainly thinking of the cover story trip. I forget if we even asked you directly if Joker was going to be in the game, but it was all like, hey, check out this Black Mask character. Isn't he scary? <laughs> what a big bad for, uh, throughout the entire game. Uh, but what was your journey over to DICE like then? Did DICE headhunt you from Warner Brothers? Were you ready for a change of pace? What was going on? Uh, what was it? like? Um, I guess there's just there's an opportunity that came up. And the Battlefield property is something that I have always had a really strong connection with it is my most played game i think in my life in terms of hours uh you know battlefield 1942 i spent a huge amount of time in desert combat uh i don't know if you played desert combat no, at all. No. um so that was kind of the precursor to battlefield 2 that was a mod that was made by a bunch of guys and um weirdly enough uh one of the guys that made desert combat one of the kind of principal guys behind that is a guy called joe halper and his wife works at epic and um so there's, I guess a lot of people in the industry know each other, but uh, I nerded out with Joe when I found out that he was one of the guys that worked on Desert Combat, and they helped DICE work on a lot of things for Battlefield 2, so they prototyped a lot of mechanics like helicopters and stuff like that. So there's a whole bunch of people that know each other, uh, and uh, yeah, I guess uh, the opportunity can probably just jumped out of that. Yeah. Is the old Arkham Origins team still intact over in Montreal? Did everybody kind of go their separate ways? The studio's been quiet for so long. Oh, I don't think I can say anything about what other developers are doing. That's that's naughty. Okay, all right, fair enough. Uh, I'm sure when the studio is ready to announce something, they should be the guys to announce what they're doing. Yeah. No one else should talk about that. Yeah, definitely. So when you headed over to Dice, what were your first impressions of actually walking through those halls? Um, you know, Dice is a is a pretty phenomenal studio in a lot of ways. I think the thing that that really uh, was impressed on me is they're a studio that never really uh, rests on their laurels. They, they are, they're very humble as a studio and as a team. You know, like a Battlefield team is who I've been working with. There's other projects, obviously, that the studio has done too. But they're very, um, they're very hard on themselves, and I think that that's a wonderful quality because that means you're always reaching and aspiring and trying to do better. In terms of like uh, critical reception or just the technology of the past or what angle? Everything. Nothing's ever good enough, which is great as a developer because um, I think when you, uh, if you started to believe in your own hype, that's when you'd start to relax and say, you know, I'm, I'm the best at what I do, so, so why try harder? Instead, even at stuff that I think that DICE is the best at, they are always pushing to go further, you know, to do better vehicles, to do better firearms, to do better maps, to do, in, in the case of what I'm working on, better single player. So uh, it, it, that is where you break new ground, I think. That is where you can push the envelope. So um, I don't know, a good example for this for the Battlefield property would be um, Faces. 
Now, I think DICE does magnificent faces, and they also have magnificent facial capture and performance. Um, and they work very, very hard to make those characters look believable and real. Uh, when I looked at BF4 as a consumer, and I'm looking at someone like Irish, and I'm looking at his face, um, I believe in him. I believe he's a real person, right? And it feels like a very, very uh, intense uh, realization of, you know, Michael K. Williams, the actor. So um, getting to work with the team that uh, brought that character to life and brought that actor digitally into the game was something that was very exciting for me so that, uh, you know, we could bring that to bear on the sort of stories we were going to tell. Yeah. So where does that humility and like the drive to do better come from? Is it just part of Swedish culture? Is it come from like the top, the old timers at Dice, like Lars Gustafsson and stuff? Or where, where's it coming from? Oh, I wish I could tell you. I think a big part of it is Swedishness, though. I think that uh, Swedish people, um, ooh, but to be careful of what I say, because it's a huge generalization to talk about a whole country, but I think that at least the people at Dice, um, they take pride in their work and they work hard, but they, they, uh, they don't ever, I don't know, I guess they don't, they don't really yell about it. They always, as developers, when we finish something, usually we can still see all the problems in something that goes out and you kind of grit your teeth and go, oh, I hope people like it because I know there's a hundred things I'd want to change. Um, and I think that um, even when things are, you know, at the top of their game for Dice, they, they still want to do that. And on the next project, they will tackle those things that they, they brought with that list for them to push the boundary forward. So it's, yeah, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so when you walk into the studio, are you assigned specifically to the Battlefield 1 project? Are you just kind of mulling about and thinking about the concepts overall of Battlefield's campaigns going forward? Oh, uh, I have to be careful what I talk about there as well with history. Uh, when I joined, uh, some things were already set in stone. It was already a World War One game. It was moving in that direction. There was a bunch of things already in production. And uh, I got to partner with some specific people at that time as we were building up the single player team. So Stefan Strandberg is the creative director on the whole project. And so um, there was a bunch of a bunch of things which uh, I think were important to the studio and the organization, and people were enthusiastic about for World War One, but also an openness going, what would make great stories here? What, how could how could we, you know, blow away everyone's expectations based on past battlefield games, defy, you know, what they might expect in one of these things, and do something really new and and kind of shake up the format. And uh, I think that you know I I applaud the studio and, you know, publisher EA's willingness to go, you know what, there's a lot of things you could assume, but we're going to not, we're not going to take those assumptions and we're going to rethink a lot of things and try some bold, you know, make some bold decisions. Even by going to World War One, that's an extremely bold decision. It's not an easy decision uh, because when you first think of World War One, when you picture it in your mind, it's not immediately cool. It doesn't immediately jump out at you as like, oh, it's just like that movie I like or it's just like that book I love or it's like that comic I read. It's like, it's this this vague area which is I think people are aware of the fringes of the history of it mm -hmm. and in some cases you know uh, okay let me give you a test Ben oh god uh, give me uh, the name of the most famous person associated with World War One for you <sighs> the name even jumps out at you let's see I mean Lawrence of Arabia has to be up there but that's probably just because I played your campaign <laughs> But before Battlefield 1, I don't know what I would have said. I don't know if there's like the one go-to figure. Woodrow Wilson? I, I, think, I don't know. I think most people would probably come out with the Red Baron. Oh, right? sure. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's red, the Red Baron. And I think a lot of people are aware of the name Lawrence of Arabia. But they're not always aware that he fought in World War One. Yeah, that's true. Um, and so beyond that, I think it starts to get a bit fuzzy for people so you know it's not like um like other you know, i don't know I'll, I'll 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 lean on battlefield 4 right because it was the last game the team did mm -hmm. so um it's a you know more of a modern techno thriller there's uh social political s distress between china and the u.s you know it taps into headlines it taps into uh the world today and and there's a lot of stuff to mine out of there uh, in fact a lot of people have been playing in that area for quite a while whereas you go back to battlefield one and it doesn't leap out at you the same way mm -hmm. so we've had you know uh, people like stefan who's a huge world war one nut 
and another uh, person who's uh, worked with them, Martin Copperhead, the two of them are the two guys that are really responsible for getting Battlefield 1 off the ground at the studio because they've been trying to get that game started for over 10 years. Do you know what resistance they met before? Was it just people being like, ah, that tech is not really going to make for great gameplay? Was that the core of it? That could be a really good interview for you to talk with them about. Yeah, uh, yeah. I wasn't there, obviously, for those 10 years. I mean, I joined after this thing had, had begun, but... Um, I think I, I go back to my original point. I think a bunch of it, uh, and I'm I'm not saying it was. I'm saying I think it might be because it's not as obvious, right? There isn't a thing where you go. It's just like Indiana Jones, just like that, right? And you bam, okay, I got it. I got. I understand where that's from. There's a bunch of creative work and a leap of faith you have to make when you go. This could be good. How do we make it good? Uh, okay, I guess we have to. Tr you know, and then you have to start exploring things and prove that it's going to work. Do you feel so, like it's really, um, does it energize the team more than we'd think to have a bold setting like that? Uh, can you feel it in the halls when someone's working on a project which is a relatively safe setting versus one which is a little bit nuts? Um, I think there's always there's always uh, parts of a project where people don't know exactly how it's going to shake out, right? Uh, and uh, the, <laughs> the best... Uh, the best reference point I've got for this is actually a conversation, an interview with Donald Sutherland I saw. I think this must have been in the 90s, and I think it was I think it was when the Lost Boys came out, right? <laughs> Deep so cuts, I think he was right. interviewed on something with regard to what Kiefer Sutherland had done, right? And uh, I can't remember, this was maybe in a UK uh, film interview thing, uh, I think it was. Anyway, they asked him what it was like watching your son uh, being in this movie. And uh, he described it as absolutely terrifying. And he described it as like peeing in the bed. <laughs> and the interviewer was like, wait, what? What do you mean it's like peeing in the bed? And he's like, well, when you first see it, when you're first there, there's like this rush of warmth. <laughs> and then you hope it doesn't get cold. <laughs> and he said it was great because it didn't get cold. It was great. So he was really happy with whatever. I can't even remember what, I guess this is probably The Lost Boys. Uh, what his son had done, and I think in a game generally there's that sense that like when you're when you're trying to do some breakthrough, when you're trying to do something new, be it a setting or a feature, or um, bring everything together in an experience, there's this hesitation of, uh, is this going to work? Should and I then, piss this bad? But when but when things click, when a mechanic clicks, and you're like, oh, and you want to show it to people in the team, and you show it as a group, there's that rush of warmth. There's like, yeah, we did something, we've realized something. Uh, and so there's this, there's this, uh, you know, blood pumping effect there that you get out of it. And I, th I think, I don't, I don't know what the, I don't know what the safest bet in games would be. I mean, uh, so I don't have a good example, but you know, I'm sure they had to have micro breakthroughs, and whatever the hell they were doing iteratively mm -hmm. as well. And so, for us, I know that when we did our first playable with biplanes. Or when we did our first kind of part of the story where we told, you know, the introduction of the tank crew, it was very hairy first trying to put these things together. Okay, because look at look at Battlefield 4 again. Yeah. Those planes were not accessible. They were there's an elite bunch of guys who own with those planes. They're really, really good with them. But most people getting into those planes go, What's this? How do I fly this? Bang, they get shot down. And they're like, I don't think planes are for me. Yeah. That's really hard. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, I think we got some wins with, with uh, what we did trying to make planes accessible for everyone. Yeah, for sure. So what did you recognize as the limits when you guys were brainstorming about a World War I campaign? I mean, you're, you could talk about this for years and just map the most ambitious game ever made. So what did you see as the barriers that will eventually stop you and you have to actually ship this thing? What Can I ask you to repeat the question there? What did I see as the barriers to shipping? Uh, no, what did you see as like the limits to the extent that you could push this campaign? Oh, um, well, I think the first limit was like we had to choose only so many stories. Yeah. Uh, because there are so many possible stories from this era because it's untapped. And there are a bunch of mechanics which are there and are, which from us and from a production perspective were coming. They weren't there, but they were coming. Um and we had to choose some of them, and we couldn't choose everything. You know, there's there's no naval component in what we've launched in the game. There's no single player where we're we're on a boat, for example. Yeah, well, I guess you kind of start on one in the Australian little right, segment, but, but it's it's basically a part of the land map. Yeah, uh, 
so there was a whole bunch of things like that where I was like, well, that, that could be really interesting. Uh, and there are a lot of interesting uh, places and battles to draw on, for example, World War One with the naval component. But we didn't get to choose them all because we could only make so many because we knew we wanted to do the best job with what you know, with what we were going to have time to deliver. Well, what were the discussions going back then about just making it a series of short stories? Were there discussions early on about making it one continuous story? Oh, uh, so like I said, I came in during, uh, I came in uh, after a part of this discussion had had formed. Uh, so when I joined, um, there was initially a plan that is, wasn't exactly what we shipped. Um, and I have to be careful with what I describe here. But I think that what we went through as a process is we tried to find what we could that would give us, it would basically give us everything we wanted. Okay, so let's look at the boxes we wanted to check. We didn't want to do something about insane adventurers running through World War I with a story to save the world, right? We didn't want something with a global threat. We did want something that let us go to many of those places and experience, you know, riding a horse in the desert or driving a tank through the mud or flying a plane through the Alps. And, and you know, these kind of boxes are like, how, who would do this? No <laughs> one would do all this stuff, right? Yeah. No one did it. No one would do it. So um, I think that the tone that would have come out of having to find a way to thread someone through all of that just did not meet the criteria we wanted, which was to tell something that was relatable, to tell something that was grounded, and to tell something that felt like if it, it didn't happen, but it could have happened. Um, and I think that right then there, if we looked at trying to thread a needle through all those different things, it would have felt like something that didn't happen and could never have happened and would have need to have been, you know, um, probably the closest example, I guess, would be the modern Sherlock Holmes movies, right, where you have a historical setting with a character who's completely exceptional, who can go to these wild and crazy places and do things, but he does them because he is unique in the world. And instead, we wanted people who were real in the world, right? People who were there and who could die and who could suffer and, and, and face the challenges that real people did rather than someone who's superhuman. That's got to be which you've had a lot of history with. But how do you balance that? Because being a real human as just cannon fodder in World War I is not a fun game pitch. So how did you guys talk about that balance between those two? Uh, um, I guess... You, you, what you said there is true, but we didn't really think of it that way. I guess it's more coming at it the other way, going, what would be a fun way to realize one of these roles that taps into the mechanics that we have in the game or that we're developing very soon in the game as we were going? And uh, how could we build a story around that? So um, a big part of that really was bringing the right people on board the team. Um, we have a fantastic writer associated with the project, a guy called Stephen Hall. And I think that he brought a wonderful uh, sensibility to be able to realize, to be able to ground people in the situations that you know we put them in and make it feel like, uh, I guess the challenge in a game is always to tell you what you have to do, right? What is the goal of what we're gonna do next? Why is it important to you? Uh, and how show as you're going through it how is the character that you are playing how is he kind of socially embedded in that what does it mean to him what's at stake for him uh or her and uh how do you how do we make you feel something about that when you you're there rather than just go oh i, I got it his brother he loves his brother i got it <laughs> right like instead it should be like i care about that guy i want to i want to be there for this character and help them through this and 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 i feel it in my heart so um you know Great writer in Stephen, you know, our composers produced extremely moving material. We had two cinematic directors, um, uh, Marcus and Frederick, uh, who um, are enormously talented and managed to uh, bring, uh, you know, a very uh, cinematic styling to our, it's just a ridiculous thing to say, a cinematic styling to our cinematics, but it's true. <laughs> we have very powerful cinematics when we have them. So I think... Uh, Rather than saying, you know, we had a bunch of highly specific goals, how did you arrive at them? I think what I'm trying to say is we hired great people. Yeah. And we worked with great people. And so I think a lot of that power of that setting of World War One, and how, um, how you know, emotionally significant it is for people, historically significant, and how important it was to respect the conflict that took place, add all that up, that's how we got there. Interesting. 
You want to talk about the history of that the opening mission and just jumping around from perspective to perspective? How early on the table was that there? Oh, uh, <laughs> how early on the table was that there? That's kind of a tricky one. Uh, we, that was the last level we finished. Uh, and we did prototypes with that relatively early. Um, and uh, we had plans for that to be, you know, it's, it's video game development. You always have more plans than you get to realize, you know. I, one thing that might be interesting if you ask developers in these future things, what did you cut? What did you not get to make? Because they'll have a list. Oh, there was these things. Uh, and let me tell you, I'm really excited about them. Or they'll go quiet because they want to stick them in their back pocket and have them for later. That's usually the case, yeah. yeah. But, you know, that whole section there, I think, actually was empowered by the fact that we trimmed it down because we did expect that. We did initially plan for that to be much larger. Uh, and um, instead, because of the power, I think, of the idea and the fact that it was the opening of the game and we were just relentless in polishing it, it made it very concentrated, which grant I think that's what granted it the power. It is, you know, compressed down. If that was stretched out over half an hour or 45 minutes, I think you wouldn't have the same emotional reaction to it that you do. Yeah, no, that's true. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. relatively late. Some extremely focused level designers working on that, and and they did you know great work. Yeah, definitely. How much did you study the genre when you were hired on at Dice? I mean, did you go through and play some of the greatest shooter campaigns of all time and take a lot of notes? How much did you think about it before going in? Of like, okay, I think this is what works for a single player shooter campaign. Well, I mean, I guess I'm a huge gamer, so I I, I play pretty much all the big games that come out every year. Uh, how much how much research did I do? I mean, I guess you do a lifetime of research when you're playing <laughs> as much as you can that's come out. Yeah. Uh, but I think that it's funny. I, I understand what you're saying. I think that the if you play Battlefield 1's war stories, I think it almost feels like something people have been waiting to see in a way that it isn't revolutionary. You know, it's not like we've gone... You thought you knew Battlefield, but time travel, and there's a whole new kind of like mechanic you've never thought of. Instead, you know, there's been tanks in Battlefield for a very, very long time since Battlefield 1942. There have been aircraft. You know, there haven't been horses. Okay, that's a new thing. <laughs> but, but fundamentally, you know, using firearms, gadgets, having a character role, uh, and getting in and out of vehicles and being able to play it the way you want to play, that has been there since Battlefield 1942. So rather than going, you know, what's going on in the rest of the space, I think the thing that everyone at DICE was really looking for was going, this multiplayer thing is working really well. How can we find a way to bring that into the single player? Because that's great, and we're not doing it. <laughs> there was a very conscious awareness, we're not doing it. We're, you know, we're going through corridors, and we're doing scripted encounters, and, you know, they're very polished, but that's not what Battlefield's about. And so I think it was really about being inspired by what Battlefield is about. And why you have a smile on your face when you want to, you know, all my best user stories as a gamer when I want to tell people about this thing that happened, they're all battlefield moments, mm -hmm. crazy moments where, you know, you get into some big fight with some guy on a map and you're tangling with them and you're, you're killing each other and you're, you're trash talking each other on the chat channel or something like that. And, and they're, they're magic moments to you and they're extremely boring for someone to hear <laughs> as, as you're trying to explain it to them. But, uh, you know, that's the power of that game. Um, and so the, the, our real inspiration was going, how do we bring that power into single player? Huh. And I feel like you're a, you're a focused narrative guy. You like to tell concise stories. How do you align that with the concept of Battlefield multiplayer, which is, hey, huge arena, squad-based gameplay, go nuts, have fun? Um, well, I think I, I had a really uh, interesting conversation. I remember this. I, I, I come back to this a lot. Um, with uh, I had a conversation with Corey May. Have you 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 guys heard Corey on the show? I'm sure. Yeah, before. he worked on Arkham Origins with you. He's the writer of Assassin's yeah. Creed. Yeah. So he's a, he's a fantastic writer, and I really enjoyed working with him. Now, um, I was talking with Corey once about why Skyrim gets huge respect for its story, and we're trying to kind of dig into that. And what is it? And he said a very astute thing. I'll never forget it. He said, um, "People love their story in that game." I don't think that they love the story, they love their story. And that, that to me is a little diamond. It's like, wow, that's like a home truth right there. And I think that people um, in Battlefield in a similar way, it's obviously not in the same scale, the same way as something like Skyrim, but you have these little stories of when you spawn in with 
a random stranger or a fr bunch of friends you're playing with. Like one of the things I always did in, in Battlefield 2 was I played a helicopter pilot and I have a friend who's a fantastic gunner and we had really, really good uh, tactics. We had really good techniques of playing together and we had a shorthand for communicating. It, and uh, you know, we had really good ways of, of it, entertaining ourselves and playing in that game. Um, and I think that the, the stories you have about the, the rounds that you played and the wacky things that happened, that's where the thing we had to embrace lived. And that's, we had to find a narrative that would work with that, you know, that puts you in, an, in, a, in a location, in a setting, and says, these are tools, these are techniques, these are weapons that you have. And the game should have systems that, as much as possible, support you using them to make it your way to solve the problem rather than highly prescriptively telling you exactly what's going to happen and then giving you a slow motion animation of what the writer wrote. It's more about yeah. trying to give opportunities to express yourself with the battlefield tools. I imagine a lot of multiplayer focused people listening will hear this and be like, man, single player sounds like a ton of work, probably a lot of money. <laughs> if multiplayer is that fun, just double down your efforts on the multiplayer side of things. What's even the point of having a focused narrative at all? Well, I, I understand there's some people that are devoutly, you know, obsessed with multiplayer and battlefield, and they may they may have never played the single player before. I'd like to think that some of those guys hopefully will play single player in Battlefield One and go, "Wow, this this connects with what I've played in multiplayer and gives me a fresh perspective on it." I think another thing it'll give you is it'll give you a perspective on that world, that era, that setting, and I think that's something that only really single player can do. Because when you're playing multiplayer, there is okay, there's dialogue about things like the immediacy of danger, of, you know, getting told a vehicle's coming or that a weapon's been deployed or someone needs help from medic. But the thing that single player does is it gives you human beings set up against this big epic war and they're steeped in the reality of that situation in a way you can't really get in the multiplayer match. So um, I think that they might get an appreciation out of what it's like to be a soldier for one of these nations facing one of these problems there. And I think that will give them hopefully some more resonance to the whole setting beyond, you know, beyond it just being a coat of paint on weapons and uniforms and maps. Uh, I think it's, you know, as a whole package, it, it transports you to that era and gives you an understanding of it and a feeling about it and hopefully a respect for it too. Yeah, for sure. Can we hone in just on one specific point in the campaign here? Can we talk about in the tank mission, uh, when they sing the song, Show Me the Way to Go Home, which a lot of people would be like, oh, it's like Jaws. It's like Jaws in World War One in a tank. You want to talk about the discussions going into that decision there? Oh, you know, if you play that mission, there's actually multiple songs. Really? Yeah. You know, if you play that level, there's a lot of dialogue in there, which plays in different conditions. And our VO producer slash designer, Justin Langley, really overdid it on that level. There's just so much stuff. I... I can't tell you how many times I've played those levels and I still hear new stuff all the time. I think that what we needed there, we need to, we need to set up a, a victory and the crew coming together so that we could hit you with the gut punch of what comes next. So it's about contrasts. It's about setting you up before we knock you back down. Yeah. I have some bad news for you though, Eric. Uh, it turns out that song was written in 1925. Uh, there are a few uh, chronological liberties we've taken there. The, the song in the opening is also, I think, from the 20s. Yeah. How the serious did you guys take that? Was that a big debate amongst the team about should we be 100% literal here? There is. I mean, I, I think everything gets questioned, but did, did it feel right? Did it, ha did it invoke an earlier time? I think that was kind of what sold it for us. Uh, you know, we're, there's always options. I think there are ones which we found which were uh, chronologically right. Okay, so a, a good example there would be the songs in the tank. Um, one of the songs there is Pack Up Your Troubles in is it your old kit bag. Uh, and that is a song of the era. Um, and we recorded both, and we realized we could use both. And we have another one in there, too, and I'm struggling to remember what the third one is. But uh, in that case, you know, we can have we can have our cake and eat it. I think as long as it's not Britney Spears, right? <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> that would have been the most memorable moment of the year is World War I uh, soldiers singing Hit Me Baby One More Time. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll save that for the next trailer. Ooh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> so... But I've, on that same token about like, you know, want to be relatively faithful. We were joking on the podcast last week talking about the game about how so many of the guns and the tanks and the tech just seems novelty weird. And we understand a lot of it's weird back then. But how much did you guys on the team think 
All right, this gun is really weird looking. They didn't use it that much, but it should be front and center because it's so funky. Uh, you know, I'm not really that involved with the firearm choices. There, There's a whole department of guys whose job is to obsess over every detail of, of you know, ballistic accuracy, detail, uh, weapon history. Uh, my, my role, thankfully, was reduced to kind of going into an armory going, that one looks interesting. Uh, <laughs> can we give this one to this guy? And so, kind of more, uh, more, you know, talking to the experts in that field. I think that there is a lot of weirdness in World War One. You know, there's a lot of things where people would roll out some exotic idea, and people would say, "This is never going to work." And another guy says, "This is going to end the war." And sometimes they were amazing inventions, and sometimes they just completely failed, uh, like deploying gas originally, uh, and then the wind changes. <laughs> And blows it back on your own trips you know like uh there's a lot of weird ideas which uh yeah created um you know they they, they defined the modern age the ones that were successful but uh there was also a lot of oddball things in there yeah for sure i'm really jealous of you you have a really interesting career because you get to learn imagine like learn everything possible and immerse yourself in the world of like the Hulk for years and years and your work back then. And then like all Batman, just take the deepest dive possible working with DC. And now you've just been studying world war one for years and years. Does it feel depressing to immerse yourself in a horrific war for that long? Or is it just the backdrop to working with a good team? Oh, I think it's certainly more to the latter. Uh, you know, I get to work with guys that I consider to be legends in their field and I'm inspired to work with those people especially when I've been playing games that they've been making for so long and obsessing over them. So that's, that's huge getting to work with people who, you know, I respect so much, uh, in terms of the subject matter, I mean, war is definitely a very brutal thing it is, uh, it is the definition of brutality, I guess. Um, I think that we're in a unique position and then we get to leverage some of that and kind of draw people's attention to it. And I think one thing, that's inspiring to me is that we've heard a lot of people being drawn to World War One and learning more about it as a result of what we've done for this game. And so I think there is, you know, there's kind of a lack of the definitive movie, for example, for the war. Um, and so it drives people to, to Wikipedia, it drives them to possibly getting books and, and, and learning more about the era. And it feels like there's always more to learn. Like I'm constantly surprised by, you know, how many things I thought I knew about. And then when I would go and dig in on a subject, I'd realize I knew nothing about it before I, I got there. And, and then there's this limitless amount of material to dig through. So thankfully we had some really great specialists. Like I mentioned Martin before, Martin Copperhead. He, man, that guy is just a fountain of information about the era and is hugely inspired by by that. So he was huge for our team in yeah. that aspect. I feel like people are really thirsty for info about World War One. Like a couple weeks ago on the podcast, I mentioned like Dan Carlin's Hardcore History podcast series all about World War One, and I've had so many people tweeting to me like, hey, could you send me the link? What was that podcast you mentioned? Like, People are really eager to learn about it, probably just before playing Battlefield 1 so they can appreciate the campaign more, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. So looking back on the entire development saga for you, what do you, what do you think was the smartest decision you and your team made along the way? What are you happiest with in retrospect? I think, I think the thing I'm probably happiest with is that our stories, they're kind of sad souls, right? They're, the format that we adopted let us break a few hearts. Uh, and that was, that was really good in that we didn't have to tell, you know, um, I think, okay, I think the obvious story to tell in a way would have been to start the game where you are Prinkip and you shoot Franz Josef in the car and then you cut to a bunch of armies nation up you know, arming up and the nation's facing off and some voiceover uh, uh, driving this along. And then suddenly you are uh, winning the war. You have to win the war for someone and you fire the last bullet of the war, the last, be it, be it the last physical one or the last significant one. And you put the full stop on the end of the sentence for World War One, and you told people <laughs> why it existed and why it was important to win it. And, and all about the socio you know economic climate and give them a theory as to, to why it happened and how you stopped it and I think that is the total opposite of what we wanted to do we wanted I think that you know this that's something that's interesting to read about in terms of why it happened and different theories about why it happened but I think putting real people in those situations let 
So you add depth to the whole experience of every time you play Battlefield 1. So it's less about what was Italy up to and more about what was it like to be a tank driver? Uh, what, you know, what was it like to join a unit that had lost someone? Yeah, and I feel like the video game industry has a lot more wiggle room in terms of a room to grow in terms of dealing with sadness in a story. It's not really done too often. Yeah, and I think that, you know, World War One, you know, World War One is not defined by jokes. <laughs> it's not defined by, uh, I think it's defined by loss is what it is. You know, it's, it's, it is a huge and terrible tragedy that happened on a global scale. And I think that the format that we got let us feel some of that when we play. I, I'm not going to. I hope I don't sound too too pious there, but I, I think that you know the the, the moments of, of loss and sacrifice I think in the game are they're the parts I'm most proud of that we managed to pull off moments where you can feel something about these characters, and I think that the format let us do that. Yeah, and now the team gets to feel uh, elation as if you won the war when the game comes out uh, because people seems to really be enjoying it, and specifically the campaign. Like myself personally, I feel this way a lot, but a lot of people are saying like, yeah, I never thought I would be this into a battlefield campaign, but the short story format works really well for you guys. Well, thank you, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm really, uh, uh, I'm awestruck by the response that we've had. I'm very thankful for it. Yeah, definitely. Well, cool. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do next, and if you keep this short story format rolling into the future for Battlefield, it's a, it's a, it's a good one. Well, I'm glad people like what we've done. Thank you so much for watching this excerpt from the Game Informer Show podcast. You can click right here if you want to subscribe and listen to the audio version of the full show. Full episodes air every Thursday, and they feature Game Informer editors sitting around talking about the biggest reviews, previews. We talk about exclusive impressions of Game Informer's cover stories. We have long-form developer interviews. Everything that's great in gaming. So every Thursday, be sure to check it out. Mm -hmm.